Good evening, my Wednesday Warriors. It is another fantastic, vibrant, and man, the vibe is strong tonight. I'm just like looking at the chatters and everybody's fired the hell up. And I think it's maybe, you know, you guys are all just a reflection of my inner world and I'm the only one that exists and I'm super excited. So it makes sense that you guys are too. I love you all. <laughs> what, what? We got uh, we got Slick Dissident, of course. He's got feathers in his hair. You know that that means that he found them at the end of the sidewalk. And uh, we got Topher, of course, ready to rock a slideshow prepared by our main man, James Frosch, a family fun guy. We're going to revisit this topic that we got into a bit with him and Beth Martins a month or so ago. We're going to come at it from a more prepared angle with uh, the fact that last time we discussed this thing where we don't register our kids with the government. <laughs> like, what if we didn't do that? What would that mean? But we didn't quite get into the nitty gritty as much as James would have liked. And Topher, my man here, he's also following that particular path as a dad. So he's got plenty to say on it. And in particular, just knows a lot about the best rhetoric to help us understand our jurisdiction as creators with the creator mm -hmm. rather than in Babylon as slaves. So Really excited about this. Legends in the chat. Thank you, everybody who is chatting in the live. And thank you, everyone who's checking this out later. Big appreciation. Big thanks. Big ups to everybody for sharing this podcast with your friends, with your Telegram group chats, whoever. Your mom. Definitely share it with your mom. Uh, or a mom-to-be, maybe, is better. <laughs> yeah. So, guys, how's everybody doing? Really well. Yeah, man. Doing great. Are you at home, Topher? Your power went out today. Are you back in action? Yeah, yeah. The power just went out a little bit. The, we got a little bit of snow, so I think the the power lines are just getting used to it. Oh, uh, my special lady from Canada says this isn't even a snow day. It doesn't even count. It, it it's not. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like everybody yesterday was like, "Oh, there's a storm coming," and when I lived in Michigan, you know, having six inches of snow is like every day. So th th this really isn't anything. Right on. So, James, how you been since we last talked? How's the family, my man? Oh, dude, doing great. Um, we're expecting uh, probably twins from our goats. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we got we've got uh, more kids. Two, yeah, more kids, more kids on the ground soon. Uh, so that's like our big area of excitement on the homestead. Um, honestly, man, just to kind of circle back, it's it's hard to find a jumping off point for this topic. Uh, the ultimate remedy is going to be behavior. Like we have to change our behavior mm -hmm. and that provides us the ultimate remedy with, uh, in, in regards to our relationship with the commercial system or anything else is, um, you know, if you want to change, if you want to change your life, change your mindset. And that's a, that, that's a behavior that is oriented within ourselves. So we have to start from that place. And so, Honestly, that's where I feel like I'm waking up in the morning and just trying to uh, sharpen myself as much as anyone else that's put themselves on the path of truth. Because like it's a it's an everyday thing, and um, and you, you don't really you don't realize how much momentum you have built up in your uh, in your thinking process until you start to have that recursive thought and that reflective thought. That's uh, it's kind of looking back on the wake that you've created with your with your thoughts so far. Cool, man. Uh. <laughs> I got to I got to say something right out the gates. Like the synchronicities are hitting hard. Hold on. I just want to give a little promo for James. I, I know you'll remember because you're. Oh, really, man. Okay, it's so. already happening. It's already happening. Just saying, I just really quick wanted to let everyone know that on the PAT Life, Pat Life podcast, James just dropped a new episode. Topher's got a recent show with Gabriel. There's all yeah. kinds of good content with this crew, so. That's all I wanted to put out there. Check out Pat Life. Check out Bio Charisma, Topher's new podcast. Get out of everybody, but not till after this is over, of course. Yes. Okay, as you were, Gabriel. Oh, my gosh. Before you mentioned the twins, I mean, just seconds before you mentioned the twins, like between the credits and you saying the twin goats were coming, uh, I'm already a little bit on the page of where we're going to take the topic tonight. I'm thinking about uh, a Riga constellation. The charioteer and the fact that he has a large mother goat on his shoulder um, and he has two baby goats behind his back. And I was thinking about the Old Testament 
law about double portion inheritance for the eldest kid. And all the other kids just get the regular, you know, they split up the difference, but the eldest child gets double portioned uh, inheritance. And then I was thinking, what if this is also a tactical strategy for having your first child, your firstborn, sacrificed to the public, registered in the public, and then keeping the other children reserved in the private? And that was totally on my mind. And then you dropped, we got twin kids on the way. And then they're goats. They're twin goats on top of it. That's so far out. Oh, what, man. When you thing. look at all the, uh, when, when you look at the Abrahamic religions and historically speaking, in particular, the ones that wear tiny hats, inheritance and keeping money in the family line is a super big deal. You know, the states with the highest population of Jays have got laws that allow them to have first cousin marriages. And in other places, it's not allowed for this exact reason. This is a very Abrahamic idea, the strict control of inheritance. And what you just said is a whole nother level that the firstborn may on surface look like they're getting the sweet deal. But actually, they're the ones being offered to the, you know, offered up on paper as the proverbial sacrifice interesting yeah one thing that that makes me think of with double the inheritance is like you the firstborn gets most of mom and papa's attention and so it that's that's sort of like a double inheritance you, they can get both the uh the light and dark aspects from both parents because i'll tell you just from uh from joffrey our first to emmanuel our second like my, my awareness of myself and my own behavior has increased a lot um and i've been able to see how i have given him has given joffrey some of my negative tendencies without even realizing that i was doing that and it, it's really odd because uh just as a, as a personal factor like i don't really have a male figure directly above me like my father was in my life but i i for the most part kind of emancipated myself because of uh, certain behaviors, and I, he he was a, a an only ch uh, he was a only son and the youngest, and I'm an only son and the youngest. And I've got four older sisters, and I so I didn't have any uncles. So I, the only and, and both of my grandfathers died at a young age. So I had to like go out and look for truth and masculinity without necessarily having um, a, a form or a figure to kind of try to fit in their, in their shape, fit in their clothes or anything. Um, and so I I've noticed the, that's the double inheritance could be like, I can, I give him a lot of my love and a lot of my positive aspects, but a lot of the stuff that I've been blinded to in my own behavior that I, I've again, just started to put my, my uh, reflective thought towards and been able to see the wake. Um, I am becoming awake to that uh, part of myself that I've given him that I'm probably not going to give to my other children because I'm, I sit with it a little bit more. That makes sense. Well, now that we have all that cleared up, <laughs> <laughs> I'm really excited about the slideshow that we have to go over which is packed with information and like specific references it could be something we'll share in the telegram channels as well so people can just hang on to it as sort of a you know a guide or a cheat sheet to what we're going to be talking about but before you know before we really get the ball rolling i do want to kick it over to topher because he does have this new bio charisma podcast launched i think new and freshly available since we last actually had him on a vibrant i believe so yes you know, is there anything you want to tell us about what's going on with that, where people can find it, what episodes are coming up, what you're excited about? Please plug away. Everybody definitely should be checking into that. It's a great cast. You're doing awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. I haven't well, you haven't had me on yet, but you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you're the benchmark, man. You're the benchmark soon enough. I, I, I'm getting to all the podcasters and media people I know as I go. I'm trying to rotate in uh scientists and no builders. you don't have to justify to me <laughs> <laughs> no i'm not i'm just I giving you the it. i'm get i'm giving you the strategy <laughs> no it, it's uh you you guys know my love is cosmology 
And uh, I really feel like when you have the most broad picture, the most broad context, um, it puts all the data points and all the information in into, uh, it gives it um, a narrative that actually can be coherent. Um, so what I'm trying to do with the podcast is just learn. <laughs> I've always tried to learn from my guests and uh, get to a point where we can weave this really great um it's going to be a curriculum. I'm going to put a curriculum together for, for my daughter and uh, God willing, another child. And it's just something where I'll, I'll make it available for the youngins where they have the capacity to look at the world and in a way that is very vivified, very alive, not this uh, corporeal, you know, uh, addicted state that we were given. So that that's what you're I'm doing. Up great, man. I mean, you're very lively for a 70 year old. I'm, <laughs> you're doing, I can't believe you're gonna have another kid. Yeah, man. I have a beautiful young wife. So that's, that's what you do. And, um, yeah. And then on, that's just on the, on the entertainment side of things. And then in my, my private, or I should say my professional life, got some i've been building now professionally for 17 years and uh some really good projects are coming online where i get to kind of put everything i've learned from a i guess you'd say an out of the box perspective in into practice and um we're gonna have some really cool uh art installations in the near future where we'll be able to test people's biometrics relative to the base resonance of the structure, relative to the HRV of the people outside, relative to plants that are being monitored for their biorhythm. So it's it's going to be a lot of fun. Good stuff, man. To Topher, have you ever read The Celestine Prophecy? Yeah, it was the very first book my sister gave me. Man, that's exactly what that's making me uh, think about. Really good book. Yeah. yeah, that book definitely helped me make some sense of my hero's journey at a crucial point. Great book. Yeah. Some some grabble in it, but you know, not a, no one's perfect. <laughs> I was so uh, young when I read it. It was just it was perfect at the age I read it. So right here we got a family fun guy. We're looking at the shop tab. What can people find right now with your guys' uh, you know, offerings here, James? Yeah, so we have medicinal mushroom extracts. I've got um, it's a it's a five mushroom tincture. It also has honey, uh, so it's kind of more of an elixir. But it's reishi, chaga, lion's mane, shiitake, and turkey tail, mm -hmm. and they're just it's just a really great blend to support your body any time of the year. Great for detoxification and helping support your lymphatic system. Um, great for inflammation and uh, reishi is just a potent uh, medicinal mushroom and antihistamine. So it's great for allergies. Um, and uh, honestly, a lot of these mushrooms grow pretty much everywhere in the U S at some time of the year. So you can even forage for these and make your own extracts and tinctures and find them locally. Um, we have some powders and uh, some different medicinal mushroom powders, mainly just reishi and lion's mane. And then I have cultures available as well for, the aspiring enthusiast. Good stuff, man. I can definitely vouch for that remedy tincture. It supports your body's detox process and really speeds up the uncomfortable part of it. <laughs> and then you're like <laughs> back in action a lot quicker. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, like I tell people that your body still has to do the work. Like it doesn't, it's not like you put something in and then something's magically missed. Like it, it displaced something magically. Like you're still going to have this uh, this cascading effect of body processes where you're recognizing, oh, I don't need to hold on to this anymore and I can I can flush this out. Um, and so that can be that can be in like any of your body's tissues. It could be in your muscles, it could be in your digestive system. For a lot of people it's in your digestive system. Uh, just eat eat real food uh, as close to the source as you possibly can. But look, <laughs> let's go ahead and dive into it because yeah, I, don't wanna, I really don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it. I would like to just kind of discuss the the overall um, principles. The principles are few, the applications are many. So this But I goes, will say we don't have to rush. And if you know you other gentlemen have anything to weave on 
this, even if it's a bit tangential, I'd like to just take things in whatever circu circuitous route we can and we'll take as much time as we need to really get everything said that we want to say. Assuming, Heck yes. You know, <laughs> Dude, I'm, I'm gassed up because these are the people that I want to talk to about this. So yeah. I'm extremely excited. Um, yeah, so public versus private is an important concept to understand. Uh, you have to know what venue you're in whenever you're going through any sort of um, altercation, like if it's a if it's an altercation with your neighbor, or if it's um, if if you're having a, a, a traffic stop, like know know what in what capacity you're operating, and it's always you're always a private individual, and so a lot of these terms can be kind of loaded in the sense of how they're defined legally, but legally uh, or lawfully speaking, you are a living free man or woman on the land, but we have dislocated ourselves from the land into the waters of commerce. And mainly it's, it's through behavior. Like we don't farm the land. We literally do not connect to this physical reality. We're so mental that we're in this living construct that we're giving our life force to enliven it. And we kind of, we, we kind of don't get it yet, but this is an important thing to get because I think that possibly the years of our lives have been shortened because we're giving this years of our lives. So maybe Noah did live into the multiple hundreds of years because he wasn't having to enliven a, a dead institution. Well, you know, I think people have the potential to live a lot longer than what people are currently living. But I will also make the caveat that Noah is a fictional character, symbolic of the Neros, which is one deacon of time across a processional zodiacal age. I mean, not like trying to pick any arguments about it, but <laughs> uh, I do think people's I think yeah. there's wizards yeah. out yeah. there in the mountains of like China or or Tibet who are following ancient Taoist practices and because they are so private that no other public person is seeing them and thinking, you can't do that. They have a level of freedom about how they express themselves in their body that, you know, they're jumping literally from the top of a mountain to the top of another mountain. And basically they're Goku from Dragon Ball Z and they're hundreds of years old. I think they're out there, but <laughs> anyway. Yeah. yeah Toker, you know, you, you've had a, uh a master in in your lifetime that had some city yeah yeah he had a few cities interesting and, but oh. they came they came and went and they and they really came and went depending on the public private thing um i would i was getting very close in my own practice in my mid-20s to 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 I, I guess a few people thought i had this siddha of of by location because I could remote view and I could channel, but I don't think it's the same thing. I don't think that's what they're talking about. But when I got supremely private and pretty much isolated, whatever contexts were out there, like I disengaged from all public contexts, um, that, that greatly concentrated my energy and my, the, the last podcast I was in, um, my, my friend Moshe Daniel, he's, <laughs> he's like a real practicing alchemist and he's walking that line between being a father and a doctor and an alchemist. And we were talking about like, there are there is an advantage if you want to be a pri like a supremely private person to your own, I guess you would say, um, your own pursuit. Like it, it becomes a very self related pursuit because it's only you. <laughs> I find fatherhood good because it's the bhakti path. It's it's like the public private path. You know, the public private partnership. But you can get very into Nana when you're when you're by yourself. And um, I think there are like chance that a lot of people out there that have done that. Yeah, part of it is keeping keeping it actually private. <laughs> right. It, almost like the pride that would come about from showing off how I'm better than you. I have these powers is like to eating of the energy required to even tap into those particular cities.
Like you well, have I, to keep your energy has to stay in your battery for I, anything I can, like that to be possible. I can speak directly to that because I read uh, Wilhelm Reich's Murder of Christ. And uh, that was like four years after I was in the ashram. And that was essentially when I finished that book, I quit the ashram and I apologized to the guru because in that Reich book. Reich has that effect. <laughs> because <laughs> in that book he speaks about the loop current that occurs the the orgone the chi loop current that occurs between somebody that gives false authority and he talks about how the christ you know the projection of 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 that divinity within onto other you know you'll do that and then you'll blame them for not living up to that to that you know thing and that was happening for me definitely that was that was a uh, that was before my Saturn return, my first Saturn return, and I was I was devastated that I did that to the quote unquote guru. Like I I I had that level of projection, but that book was a wonderful book. He didn't use the terminology public or private, but it it definitely fits this conversation. Nice, I'm writing that down. Thanks for that, Topher. You're welcome. So uh... Topher's full of interesting stories. He's lived a few lifetimes in one in his, <laughs> in his 70 years. Just a couple. So uh, I'm thinking a lot about Libra and, uh, you know, uh, Moses as the law bringer and the liberator mm. being at the Libra position. Uh, and also, you know, the dividing of the Red Sea and the aspect of the equinox and reading between the lines. Mm -hmm. uh, the word intelligence meaning interledger to read in between the ledgers mm -hmm. uh but also the fact of uh potentially a tipping of the scales you know after we pass that equinox the scales are tipped and uh and there is a two-tiered law system that we're constantly having to regulate in the, the you know the uneven weights and measures are going in somebody's favor at all times and that is that's what our uphill battle is and so all of these things are just really compact metaphors so that we can get our point across. Uh, and it's just beautiful that they're cosmic as well. So I just wanted to throw that on the table. Mm. Yeah, just well, so I see, I recognize the hand of Mark Passio on this particular slide. Always a useful resource. Thank you to Mark Passio for doing the work, setting up this particular concept in a nice, graphic for us yeah yeah i really appreciate all of the folks that have put uh, a lot of work and exploration into the multitudinous uh pathways to study law um but it comes down to the the, the truth of natural law is where all law stems from um natural law is pretty harsh so it's it's based upon truth and and truth is one of those things that will stand bare and naked any man um, and, and no no concept that is untrue can stand before it without completely being obliterated. Like people can people have a bullshit detector, even if they're convincing themselves otherwise about an idea. Uh, there's like there's the, the perverse psychology that uh, people want to be conned when they're being conned. It's like you, that 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 belief that people have to uh, they have to be lie to themselves. They have to lie to themselves. To put themselves into the uh, the construct of whatever that person is, is uh, containing them, but we're all contained by natural law, and it's a very um, it's a very humbling place to be. It's it as as the slide is indicating it. You can only harmonize with it, but it is unamen It's not amenable to any of our uh, conceptualizations and changes to it or perversions of it. It is going to be what it is. Um, and then man's law is based on our our contracts between one another, and also our um, and, and also like our our behavior because a lot of our our law is behavior based, and then we codify some things to to, to specify boundaries around particular behaviors in particular domains. Um, but for the most part, man's law is to Put up guardrails to keep people from driving off the off the cliff. Like I don't really have any beef with man's laws, 
but there are some institutions that take advantage of this to manipulate people for their their attention, their life force energy. And um, you can go ahead to the next slide because this is really the one that I wanted to touch on most. And so natural law can be understood through the seven hermetic principles. There are other ways that you can understand it as well. This is a great way to start working with uh, understanding your mind, understanding the mind of, uh, of different individuals. You can start to gain a, a insight. You can start to gain insight. And so the laws of, uh, or the principles of, of mentalism, all is mind or all is pervaded by the mind of the creator. And so we can adjust our individual vibration to be more harmonic or more resonant with that particular vibration. And I will also add in that in my opinion and experience, the mind that is the, that is the all mind that is the, I am essence and consciousness itself is also life force energy. So, <laughs> you know, government, which means mind control also thus means life force control. Well said. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's why I really appreciated you sharing, uh, Matt Presti's documentary and interviewing him. That was super solid just for helping people to get a grasp on how, uh, tricksters get you, hijack your subconscious or your, uh, your imagination to implant beliefs that you start to play with. It's like a kid. You give a kid something they try to figure it out, but you're trying to figure it out is actually part of the, uh, the attention game. And yes, and, and so it's it's part of it's like a Zen koan. Um, it's meant to break your mind, but these th these particular things are designed to break your mind in a favorable way for the person, for the wizard, for the wizard that designed the puzzle. Like I, I want your particular behavior to be steered in this direction. Um, I'm glad you got to check out the Presti episode. And really people, good. mark your calendars. The vibrant of February eighth to eight will be returning Matt Presti to talk about Walter Russell physics and cosmology with Dr. Bear Lando and Mike Winner from Alpha Vedic. So that's going to be, we're going to uh, learn a lot. I want to call in on that. Yeah, well, you should. Why don't you? All right. It's on. So from the cognizable principles, uh, stems positive law and from that procedural law and remedial law, then substantive law, which is where we find most of our issues whenever we're starting to speak about uh, the birth certificates and social security numbers and all of this stuff. All of the, all of the birth certificate, social security number, these forms are all going to fall under public law and they're going to be part of the uh, it, administrative law. And there, But this is the thing is that it's your property if you create it. So this is one of the things that I, I tell people about with money is that it fundamentally comes down to a property rights issue. If we are using the Federal Reserve's property, then they have the purview to control your conduct with their property. If you come in my house and you have your shoes on, and I say, leave them at the door. I'll kick you out of my house. I'll kick you out of commerce unless you're going to do as I, I say. You can you can come into this venue, but you have to perform in certain ways. Uh, perform performance and obligation are really important concepts to, un to understand because if you enter into a contract with someone that you will perform a service for them for payment, then you are obliged to perform that service for payment. So if they pay you first, and that's a stipulation in the contract is first you pay me, then I perform. Well, if you don't give them the service, then they, then they can, then it opens you up to suit. And and this, in this particular case, that would be that would be private law. Public law can be best understood as law regarding the government. So, constitutional law falls under public law because the Constitution is a limitation on government's ability to have any regulation of private activities. You get the criminal, tax, and administrative law whenever money starts to come in. With the invention of money as a Federal Reserve note and as a um, 
And as a negotiable instrument, you have to have these other venues for uh, for the control and regulation of uh, of the money. And so the, the money is just a representation of labor energy. And so this is the, the crux of where labor energy is being controlled is through criminal law, tax law, administrative. What criminal law really is if you're if you're entering your brother, but some things tend to, to, to lean in administrative and criminal law. Um, but family law, like if you start a family with a woman and you are uh, and, and you walk out on her, she is going to she has the purview to sue you personally or find a representative and it can be the state. So if you so in this particular case, the state can come in to represent in family law and, and you can have this happen through the uh, joinder of the birth certificate and the social security number because they have an interest to see that this account that is created from the, the person is not being injured from the actions of the father. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Because we can we can flip back and forth unless you guys had something that you wanted to say about that. Uh, a couple of things on my mind is like it is very difficult. We are not educated for the amount of rethinking the way things work constantly. And you know, uh, and it becomes very difficult to speak impeccably too. Once you learn these truths, you realize that your words have been not serving you as strongly as they could. And that's what all of this learning is about. Uh, but one thought that comes to mind is that you, uh, um, all licensing is uh, permission to act. And even to the extent of acting as in theater, as in a ritualistic ceremonial production, you are, have permission to act and I'm even thinking there's a there might be a fine line we should consider between acting and doing uh, in, in our lexicon. And these are like the levels of nuance that makes it really hard to speak impeccably to keep yourself out of the public. Mm -hmm. And another and point. Go ahead. And, that, and that's why at the beginning I prefaced with it's all about behavior. Like we'll keep coming back to behavior and mm -hmm. we can examine the ways in which we've been conditioned into particular behaviors mm -hmm. that perpetuate this. Um, and we can also examine some of the ways in which our, our minds are being, you know, mind controlled. The government is, is, is starting to put boundaries, put up the walls to direct us where we can actually do that in our private capacity for our families and for ourselves. Um, and some people find that freedom of journaling, like journaling can be a way that people write themselves, but you can write yourself and write yourself, you can square yourself up a little bit through uh, writing out your thoughts and through through uh, connecting with that uh, creative potential. The authority, the authority. Yeah. And, That's you know, getting into jurisdiction with the creator by creating. Right. And I think that uh, part of this practice of trying to speak impeccably, uh, remaining in equity with your own words, keeping your hands clean at all times and not sullying yourself and letting yourself put yourself in public, that is just practice for when the day comes that some bloke is going to try to get joinder or entice you out into the public. And so you'll be so well practiced at rectifying your own presumption on yourself that you'll be locked and loaded and ready. Somebody else puts a label on you, gives you some sort of, you know, any name calling, any favoritism, any, um, uh, discrimination. Discrimination is a two-way thing. Uh, uh, so if a person calls you sir, if they label you sir, that is a bribe. They're giving you favoritism. They're dressing you up in a favorable suit so you look nice for public. And they can take that, that bribe, that label that, they, that you accepted, you let them call you something other than what you want to be called. You don't want to be called anything. They don't know you. You're not in the public. They cannot add dress you. And so even the word <laughs> sir, even the word sir is a bribe. And if you accept the bribe, you're pulled into the public. So just be ready. And that's actually, that is a tactic of energy vampirism.
you psychic got... vampires use the tactic of you could call it love bombing. Sometimes it's extreme. Other times it's just acting interested and favorable to you so that you let your guard down. It's and then right. at the crucial moment, the rug is pulled out from under you. They accuse you of something or dispute something with you when you're not ready for it, when you're riding high on the hog. And then all of a sudden you feel your ability to respond, communicate, or, uh, you know, express yourself. It falls out from under you. That's how you know you're getting juiced. And in the courtroom, that is exactly what happens when some terminology, some label is applied, what have you, and all of a sudden the person is falling to pieces on the stand. But if you have, as our friend Cody in the chat says, self-proximity is coherency. <laughs> you know, if you have self-proximity, particularly maybe as the example journaling or you have some authoring or creative practice where you know yourself impeccably, then those words are you know your rubber and their glue and what they say bounces off you and sticks to them whatever something like yeah, that man. yeah and so a good phrase to say and have locked and loaded ready is do you have proof of claim that you are authorized to use that name in public and so as soon as they start trying to put anything on you attach you with this sir or bitch boy whatever they want to call you you need to ask them are you making a claim? Well, I need this certified claim that you are authorized to use that name in public. Mm -hmm. Because as far as I know, that name is not authorized to be used in public. So you're constantly keeping yourself in the private. I just had to throw all that out. This is not legal advice, by the way. <laughs> uh, we're not adding vices on anybody here. That's good, man. I saw the microphone come down, Topher. I thought wheels were up. I was ready to throw lifts off, man. <laughs> <laughs> well it's kind of very interesting the whole uh, it's it's just neat when you're like my my i hate to give all this like my own history with this stuff but my teacher that's why you're here my teacher in vedanta advaita like his whole thing was you know when somebody's trying to project something onto you in, in the spiritual world, you're always like, okay, who's projecting what onto me? And so the whole ashram, the whole thing was about not being in codependence, but being in interdependence and, and independence and just having the capacity to understand when projection was happening, when there was this like leeching, this vampirism. And so our words were monitored like, like you had to like speak in a very, very coherent way. And it was really the the month that I really decided to leave the States. I was, I was just got back from India and I was walking down the street like 3 a.m. in the morning because it was so nice out. And all these cops came and pulled over and they were trying to like bully me. And the cops were like, you know, asking me my name and they're like, what are you doing out here? And I'm like, is it illegal to be walking out here? Like, I just kept asking questions. I never let them land anything on me because they were the, I could feel because I was in such a sensitive state anyway. And I was, I was somewhat offended because I'm just walking. I'm just enjoying the night sky. I'm doing my practice and hear all these cop cars. And then they started making like uh, accusations. And so I just asked for evidence. I was just like, where's the evidence that I was that I was looking or doing that? And I didn't know anything from law. I never even thought of law. I was just coming from the standpoint of spiritual sovereignty. Which demonstrates that studying law is a spiritual right. path, if you yeah. let it be. If you're a commercial law, like, you know, you're run of the mill lawyer, maybe not a spiritual journey as much for them, but the true natural law is a spiritual journey. Yeah. The creditors I knew that turned me back, turned me to law, you know, a few years ago, as soon as they started telling me what they were telling me, I was like, Oh my God, this is the most conscious process that there is because it's not like the new age world where you can kind of hide somewhere. Not really. There's no real, you know, skin in the game. This is like, you take the most spiritual world and like, then that is grafted into all of the physical. And I was like, this is the most conscious process I've ever come across. So that's why I love it so much. Well said. Yeah. Yeah. And so this, uh, this PowerPoint and this discussion, it 
any little bit of it could be hours and hours of study. Um, so I don't even want to give anyone the opinion that this is going to do anything other than give you uh, a venue of entrance into starting to explore this stuff. Um, there, there are a few people that are really good to learn from, um, but mostly the best thing to do is just read. Just read. Don't don't go look for someone to tell you about it. Um, just just read. It, that's it, it's it's hard enough to get a straight answer from yourself. So put your actual reasoning mind to the text that has been agreed upon nationally, internationally. Like these these people act like it's real. So you should read it. Just read it. So the public is the government, including the agencies and agents, and so. There is um, a, a trick that's been played on us to become an agent of the public, to become the public, to get public assistance. You have to be the public, right? You'd have to be someone in that uh, capacity to receive a benefit from the government. Benefits and privileges are the chains. It, if you didn't know that those were the chains that were binding your feet, it's benefits and privileges. Public assistance is a benefit. Um, it is, uh, it, even elect, even electricity is a benefit. Um, it's, it's a very complex thing to start talking about this because a lot of people will start going, well, well, how am I going to pay for things? And well, what do I do? Don't get spun out. Just start learning. Um, part of the public are their statutes, their public policy, any acts of legislation, and so you should go read these things because this is how they are viewing the people as acting. They're like, well, you're acting as though it's real. So it's real, even though natural law is the realest real that's going on around us all the time. My goats are going to have two kids, probably, probably both of them. It's a pretty high chance, but I think it looks like one's going to have a single. Anyways, that's that's natural. Chickens are going to lay eggs, but. All of this, all of this that we're talking about is firmly fixed in the mental realm. So you have to see that this is the way that a lot of people are projecting and viewing us whenever we're in most public venues. Um, and so that that also includes courthouses. Uh, I think there's only one only one truly private uh, venue, and that is the Supreme Court. And I, I think it's the Supreme Court or the Supreme Court for the United States. Anyways. It, it gets really freaking convoluted with their uh, corporate name changes so that they can carry this uh, th this further along down the road. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next one. Well, those corporate name changes you just referenced are a way bigger part of the toolkit than I think is very widely recognized. I believe that every change of age and empires crumble and replacement with a new system has actually been occultly the same corporation rebranding and resurrecting itself. I've begun, I've come, I've decided I'm going to call this the, like the Phoenix doctrine, not the Phoenix event or whatever that that archaics guy talks about. I'm talking about an actual burning down of the system and resurrecting it, but on paper in the corporate sphere that the <laughs> that it's the same system whether we're talking about the romans the ancient greeks the phoenicians the holy roman empire whatever the hell it is that's happening right now this great reset but that's another another subject other than that uh this idea of the public is very helpful to understand that you don't need any of this <laughs> that before there was even a delineation in people's minds and the monopoly game was played public and private, however long it goes back in time. I think it goes back very far. I think well, it goes and, back past the shroud of, of what ancient history allows us to pierce uh, the veil of. But before there was such a thing as a public, before there is any kind of state or welfare or dependency upon a system that was a technology to rob you of no your knowledge that you gave up willingly of how you would interact with nature and your environment to be provided for in the jurisdiction of the creator, i.e. natural law. Before there was any of that, people lived, they thrived, they reproduced, and they got us to here, you know? 
That's exactly the same as when your wife, Elise, talks about <laughs> before hospitals, women were giving birth to babies without anybody, no professionals, no, you know, other than other women. The, the innate intelligence of their body told them what to do. Like their own wisdom as a being knew what to do. Well, that applies to every aspect of our survival. And I think it's really helpful for being in the jurisdiction of your creator to know that nature is designed such that you will never, no organism in any environment is in that environment without a line to access the resources that it needs to thrive. What you need is always in your environment. Truth is life force energy. They're equivalent. Consciousness is also an equivalent to that. It's like that vertical axis described by Walter Russell. And so truth is always evident in your reality, in your environment, in your perception. And that truth is also the truth of how to acquire that which you need to continue existing in this realm. It will always be there. There will always be a way. And it's the fear and the volunteering for victimhood that opens you up to be deceived and actually causes you to ask for it. And it's that deception, self-deception and, and uh, willingly being deceived by <laughs> those that tell you that you need them that allows for your health to ever be diminished or your life force energy to be given away to vampiric entities. So that's my rant on that. My question with that though is in nature you do have you do have dominance you do have bullies you do have violence. Well, I didn't say every organism acquires the resources out of that environment that they needed, but there's always enough for everything, you know. I I I'm not what I'm saying isn't refuting what you're saying. I well, I'm just giving you an internal question that I've had with this is because I agree in, with the non-aggression principle and the golden rule and all these things, but in reality, like in 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 what I'm witnessing, there are uh, racketeers, <laughs> there are you know criminal elements, there are those that that steal, and it seems like governments are like there the, are animals that trick each other. Yeah, you know? yeah. there's deceptive there, deception in nature. Yeah, that is part it, of it. And so with that, like, it's very interesting as humans, it just seems like, especially when you're at the end of an age of decadence or whenever you're, whenever things get to a certain size, you just have the, the, the predominant gang becomes the government. <laughs> and so as a human, it's, it's even a, it's even going another level, I think. And I, I'm really in the, in the thought that, if you are truly in the in in correspondence with your creator that you won't really come that much into contact with those things unless it's a, the greater teacher for your soul but let's That's just exactly say, it but just like from the perspective of there is it from a from a consideration perspective you were not necessarily dealing with fair elements. <laughs> you know, we're, we're not necessarily dealing with, you know, my idealization of lady justice in the sense that the, it's a just system. We're dealing with thieves. We're dealing with a criminal element. So what I'm, what, uh, which is what a common law system is there to help us manage as a group and a collective. You know, yeah, in a, in a pure and in a non-grabbled state, I, it, that exactly is why we have a law to begin with. I completely get that, but that's not what we're actually experiencing. What we're all interfacing with is a criminal element. So, in knowing that you're, the, I think the next level in all of this discussion is actually being honest we're dealing with criminals. <laughs> we're dealing with thugs. And so when you're dealing with criminals and thugs, then it actually becomes even a higher order experience of like, okay, we can talk of common law all day long. You can talk about using the right verbiage and not indicting yourself and not doing this, that, and the other. <laughs> but 
Oh, what's this common law handbook for jurors, sheriffs, bailiffs, and justices? <laughs> well, I think yeah, what so, you're saying makes a lot of sense. And that uh, in, in the aggregate, that phenomenon that you're describing about how the deceptive element is uh, intrinsic to nature, it reveals itself in the fact that, like you said, government's the biggest gang, or it's a cartel, or it's a mafia, that right. in a vacuum of no cartel or no mafia or no gang, a gang cartel or mafia will form because that is a particular developmental phase in consciousness that some beings spend an entire several incarnations in <laughs> just to, uh, you well, know, just well, to like finally the, get it. So, you yeah. know, the key to that is to still know that um, the wrong thing never happens. And like you said, if whatever you encounter in that sense or befalls you with that or group is there for your learning and that the obstacle is actually the path and you know you go through not not run away from but that ultimately there's a way to more more or less not even have to interact with the cartels very much as if you're not you know playing in their casinos essentially right i mean i'm i'm a total believer that you know your your frequency is your location hi elise elise and, good to see you and Glad you're here and you know, there, there might be no need in your greater self to like actually have interactions with that type of stuff. But the second in, in, in this day and age, if you're doing commerce, if you're actually, you know, out there exchanging money one way or another or currency, however you want to say it, no matter what, there's going to be an interface. There is going to be a checking in because the the gang wants their cut <laughs> the gang wants their 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 vig right and so with yeah. knowing of where, where i'm trying to get to in my consciousness is okay what does that represent in, in me like there's this thing this criminal element that no matter what wants the vig they want their cut they want their share even if I'm not taking their quote unquote services or their benefits or whatever, what, where do I have to be in my being? If I'm going to be somebody that earns, if I'm going to be a provider, how, how, how do I actually position myself? Like I've seen some ways of the property law and this, that, and the other, but I'm not of complete confidence that the people that I'm dealing with have integrity. <laughs> And that's you, part of the problem is that the title by conquest still stands and is respected because precisely. the guy, the guy, I would, the biggest. You kind of cut out a little bit there, where you start from the guy with the biggest stick. I think is what you're saying. It's. it's He's a uh, internet dropout, but he'll be you back. It happens. You have to bit. form the insert the mirror. How about now? Okay, I think you're back. Sorry about that. Um, what I was saying is the guy with the biggest stick, the one that can exert the most force, is going to be the victor. And what we've seen are um, we, we've seen fearful victors, people that will gladly take the victory, but they don't even want their faces to be known or seen. Because if so, it's the revolution again. Any revolution, name one, guillotine gets brought out. These people, if you know them by their face, by their deeds, then they get brought out into the street. Because that is a part of natural law is that if you're going to parasitize any, any community, you typically don't last unless you're parasitizing something else. And even those parasites eventually get dealt with through some response in nature. And I think that's why we see the build it up, burn it down, build it up, burn it down, get as much as you can, try to transfer it uh, to the future generation. Like they still have that respect for the future generation that a lot of us have lost in the West. I'm going to say us in this chat, but a lot of people have lost that they either don't want to have children. They want to abort the children that they're going to have. Um, and so it's, it's a challenge to get people to respect that leaving a legacy of happy people is like one of the highest things that you could do for this place. Because regardless, we're all on the same unidirectional arrow. And I was actually talking to Kyle about this earlier. I, I was saying that at the end of the day, if they want your stuff, 
they got your stuff. And you have to make amends with the creator to just let it happen, man. Uh, it's 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 not in our hands to control every single aspect of this, but we can start to control our behavior. Our behavior is going to be the thing that sets us free in inside of our minds because we're going to be like, I'm okay with what I'm doing. I'm not hurting anyone. I'm productive. I think that the lack of productivity in individuals' lives, whether you're not creating something with your hands or you're not getting your hands actually touching the earth in some form, those are the people that start to have this mind virus of a lack of abundance. Everything that you could ever have or ever want is already here. That doesn't mean that you need it or that you, even if you had it, that you would be the best dispensed to, uh, to, to use it and, and to use it properly. And, you know, it's... It, it's something where you have to be fit enough in your own life and productive enough in your own life where you start to not have that mind virus that's a lack of abundance that is talked about in, in, uh, in new Right at the end there, oh. we kind of dropped out again, but uh, we, we definitely got the gist of it. There's a lack of abundance. All right. So <laughs> sorry about your uh, internet thing there, James, but it's very mild. It just kind of happens every couple minutes occasionally and not, not a guarantee. We'll press forward with the slides, though. I think that's a good move because we're not quite halfway through them. I knew that we would talk a lot around them. This is maybe not the final word we're going to have on this subject by any means, but we'll, yeah, we'll continue. And I'll just read this slide. The private is living men and women in their lawful capacity, lawful, not the same as legal, where trust is communities are built and trust for, or sorry, where wealth is communities are built and trust is formed. The cohesive quality within society based upon agreement, whether constituted through written agreement or upstanding morality, is what constitutes the private. Yeah, and so again, I just have to go back to, to behavior. So our lawful capacity is that we aren't infringing on other people's, uh, on other people's right to live. Now, this does not include someone's right to live if their right to live is to go and murder other people. We have boundaries around the private as well. But again, it's based on agreement. Like if if someone's gonna kill someone's family member, the family's probably gonna come after that guy. Like I where we're at in the South, like I, I hear tons of stories of, yeah, they wronged my family, so we went to God. That's it, it's it's that messed up, even with the laws already there. People can go outside the bounds and go beyond the pale. Um it's up to us to be morally upstanding. It's up to us to start to form communities and agreements. The, the Constitution itself is just a trust document. It's just an agreement to vest certain powers in a group of individuals to provide for the uh, multitude of individuals. I don't want to say masses. Jesus referred to people as the multitudes, and masses just sounds like cancer. So, um, <clears throat> it's it's very important. Yeah, that's for kind us. of a Catholic word. We'll, we'll avoid that word. <laughs> <laughs> and and so it's very important for us to start setting up trusts in our private capacity. These don't have to be uh, a be a financial vehicle. It can be. You can operate a trust as a financial vehicle for the uh, holding of property, the holding of accounts and the usage of accounts. But you can have a private uh, trust that has that doesn't hold any accounts that is just holding property. And the difference between a trust and an estate is that it, whenever you die, your estate dies. But if you were to form a trust, it continues to hold that property that you vest into that uh, trust into perpetuity. And this is how this is one of the things that's talked about with the trust of St. Germain is that this is a living trust that's kept alive by the, the beneficiaries that make any claims or the uh, the trustees. So 
we are acting in a in a trustee capacity for the united the uh united states of america whenever we are operating as a commercial vessel that's whenever you're using things in your personal name you are acting as a trustee and so with that there are certain obligations that are put on us one of those obligations is to fulfill the uh the codes the acts and to perform under them and so one of those codes is the irs it, it is is title 26 and uh it, and so you have to you have to pay income taxes because you become a federal citizen and by being a federal citizen you fall under the purview of someone that that is taxed because of your usage of federal reserve notes because you're using it and, and i have a slide in here that uh, better describes that i mean it's really legalese and wordy but we can we can run through that i don't know if that's the next one um United Nations Convention on International Bills of Exchange and International Promissory Notes. Uh, cut off that last little bit. Equity, what is money, and the UCC connection. You can go ahead to the next slide. <clears throat> These are just a few of the maximums of equity. Equity will not suffer a wrong to be without a remedy. So for every statute, for everything in equity, there is a remedy. So it is up to you to discover the remedy, but most of the time the remedy is behavioral. It's whether you're engaging with the system and at what capacity you are doing so. If you're doing so in your personal name, not through a business, not through a trust. If you don't have these liability shields for the person, then you open yourself up to more personal liability. Okay. So, and then about the maximums of equity or just equity as a concept, it basically means that in order for the whatever system humans create and man's law in order for it to not essentially disintegrate under the you know the uh what would the word be entropic force of nature's sweeping away and destroying anything that is not in alignment with nature it has to have built in a remedy for every possible injury. And so the key for manipulators, gangsters, thugs, whatever, is to distract and to make sure that it is not known how to receive remedy or that remedy is possible, but it has to be in there. Like the system would fall apart. The whoever is using and abusing people through the system for that to even be possible in perpetuity and for it to last a long time and continue to be possible for them to do that, there has to actually be like, you know, their their own kryptonite has to be in there. The way to the way for the just and right thing to happen, the path has to be available. And that's a way of understanding equity, right? And the truth. The truth has to be there too. Like yeah, that's what? nature. Nature is the truth, exactly. Reality. What, what is equity? So equity can be understood as like fairness under the law. And so it, it's intended to present two parties equal opportunity in front of a, in, a, in an administrative court. Justice or right. In practice, equity is the impartial distribution of justice or the doing that to another which the laws of god and man and of reason give him a right to claim it is the treating of a person according to justice and reason and you know webster's 1828 dictionary is the way to go because you'll get <laughs> your your sentence that uses the word will be usually a bible verse the lord shall judge the people with equity with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity so it's justice, impartiality, a just regard to right or claim, as we must in equity allow this claim. Yeah. Oh, or in jurisprudence, this is another good definition. In jurisprudence, the correction or qualification of law, when too severe or defective, or the extension of the words of the law to cases not expressed, yet coming within the reason of the law. Hence, a court of equity or chancery is a court 
which corrects the operation of the literal text of the law and supplies its de defects by reasonable construction and by rules of proceeding and deciding, which are not admissible in a court of law. Equity, then, is the law of reason exercised by the chancellor or judge giving remedy in cases to which the courts of law are not competent. So that sounds like a, a lot of 1828 word salad, <laughs> but basically it's that, you know, there's, that's why you have the human factor in the system. That's why you have the chancellor or judge because they're supposed to be there to be like, all right, this is what the letter of the law says, but we're going to use our God given gift of reason and our conscience to apply the fair and the most fair and equal way of making this law be followed as possible in a, in the simple simplified way of understanding the term which basically and it means like, like that. the law of karma has to be sort of respected for the legal system to not crumble under the weight of its own you know dishonesty well it sounds like that until you start to look into how something is admitted to the court record you have to file an affidavit it has to be an affidavit or it's inadmissible in court. Like they, they'll say, "Oh, I can't, I can't hear you." If you try to go in as, uh, "I'm just a, a third-party intervener on behalf of the accused," whatever little spiel people want to make, it's court is settled out of court, not in court. Uh, what they're doing in court is are, are is hearing claims, and the only way that you can have a claim admitted in court is that it's an affidavit. Um, and so that's that's sort of which affidavit is essentially a fancy way of saying you're swearing an oath on it. Yeah. You're swearing it to God. I swear to God that that's true. Yeah. Putting it, yeah. putting it's, it in writing. Yeah. And, and a lot of people can overthink affidavits, but it really is like a claim of events, a claim of, of property, whatever. It's super simple. It's as simple as writing your uh, your term paper for something. But you sign it under seal of the notary and then the notary the second she stamps it or he stamps the the paper that is recognition by the uh by the courts and it's a it's a there's um weiss's concise um no i was gonna say weiss's concise trustee handbook is a good source but weiss's um notary handbook is a really good source for seeing the power of a notary um we created documents for our uh, for our children's birth for uh, to be signed under seal at a notary just as giving notice to the public um, whenever you are, it it's a commercial maxim that a gentleman always gives notice and so to give notice just by going to the notary shows that you already had foresight that you already intended so this is behavior your intentions are derived from your behavior. So people can see what you intended. Well, I gave the public notice that a, another that another being came into this realm. And that's as much as anyone needs to know about my family. But if you wish to monetize that and take it a step further, they're going to have you jump through different hoops. Like you may have to have a particular form that's filled out. Even if you don't have a certificate of live birth, you can still apply for a tax identification number, uh, an ITIN. There are loopholes for, they want people in the system. So if you are someone that does not have a social or does not have a birth certificate, they're like, well, we're going to figure this out. There is a path to get people into Babylon. It's harder to get out. Um, or it's, it's best to just not step foot in if your parents can if if your ancestors can show you the path before your feet are already set on the path like i i i as many of you watching have had to wake up on the path um and it's it, it can spin you out a, a couple times um but you have to ground yourself in doing something real edify 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 we're building this plane as we fly. <laughs> Is there um, anything so else you want to cover off on this slide here? I'll just I'll just rattle off real quick. Delay defeats inequity. First in line is first in time. That's why I gave notice to the state. I give notice to the state 
so that they're like, oh, okay, well, we're, we can't come claim, it, claim him as abandoned. Um, he who comes into equity must come with clean hands. Uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, where equities are equal, the law will prevail. Law trumps equity. But if you have contract, contract makes the law. A contract can easily go into, into an equitable court depending on the instruments that are being uh, exchanged in contract, if, they're, if they are, in my services. You can, you can go on to the next one. I'll just throw in here real quick. You know, these are all these are based on very ancient and old rituals and traditions. It's not this clean hands doctrine. It is not only the Masonic white gloves that they wear inside the temple, but it is also the tabernacle. It is the laws to the tabernacle, you know, cleansing thyself before you enter. These are ancient and they command respect on a deep level, regardless of how you feel about the people who made them. Uh, it's very important. Uh, and Sir Francis Bacon, that motherfucker, uh, regardless of how you feel about him, <laughs> uh, he had a he had a, a very key role in making a lot of uh, maxims of law, uh, and many of them involved equity. So I just leave that little rabbit trail for folks to pick up. And I I dropped a link to the definition from the 1828 dictionary of the word real. That's some great reading. <laughs> <laughs> what is real? <laughs> it's uh, important to have precise language around that. But looking at that definition and list of definitions will help you see that in the past, there was less of a confusion, at least among learned men, um, that the legal system and the ecclesiastical system are the same. Now we have the pretended and fictitious separation of church and state, but they are not actually separate. This is very important. Okay, we can move on. Tight. So this is uh, 12 United States Code 411. Uh, Federal Reserve notes are to be issued at the discretion of the Board of Governors uh, for the purpose of making advances. The notes shall be obligations of the U.S., and shall be receivable by all national and member banks. I have member banks underlined and bolded for a particular reason because we are also operating in that capacity. We are private, we are creditors in our private capacity that are giving ourselves over into the public by, by using Federal Reserve notes, by using their property. Um, and Federal Reserve banks for all taxes, customs, and other public dues. They shall be redeemed in lawful money on demand of the Treasury of the U.S. Um, or at any Federal Reserve Bank. This was whenever this was what people were using to go back and claim gold. And they were saying, hey, I'm going to claim my gold in lawful money. Even in the 70s and 80s, people were trying to claim for uh, gold. And they were like, uh, it just says lawful money. I don't know what you're talking about. And they're like, well, lawful money is defined as gold. And they're like, we don't have any gold. And they were trying to exchange Federal Reserve notes for gold, and they weren't giving them any because uh, the the lawful money had already been seized as collateral for the bankruptcy of the United States, and they had already moved on to something else that constitutes lawful money. And so you can go to the next slide. I have seen stuff go around from people claiming to be able to teach how to get paid in lawful money uh from your whatever your jobs are i don't know how plausible or possible that is but that it's the allegedly idea would be that it's on the ledger as you know actual credit not debt <laughs> because the us dollar is debt and we're trading around debt notes as opposed to that's the diff like the simplest way of conceiving the difference between lawful money and what we trade around called dollars Current, currently, and uh, allegedly, it, 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 it's only to um, to reclaim federal withholdings. So it does not. It apparently does not work for state taxes. Um, there are different places online that you can study about this. It is considered a process. I don't know if it works, or I, I wouldn't recommend trying it. I would recommend educating yourself. Like I said earlier, read. Read, use your reasoning line and put it to these things. Uh, this is 
412 USC 412. Any Federal Reserve Bank may make an application for Federal Reserve notes. So whenever we're making an application, we are intentionally create in, in we're intentionally creating money. Anytime that we are creating an application in the commercial system. If you apply for a car loan, it is money. If you apply for something, they take that instrument with your wet ink signature as a negotiable instrument. The application must be accompanied with payment or collateralized in the amount equal to the sum of the Federal Reserve notes. The collateral security thus offered shall be notes, drafts, bills of exchange or acceptances or bills of exchange endorsed by member banks. So whenever you sign the back of a check, you are endorsing it. So this is where the guys that are coming in saying that they're claiming lawful money, they're doing so through their checks by making a restrictive endorsement. Again, I do not know if this works. This is a method that some people try and claim to work. But they are making a special reservation that they are not going to inflate the monetary supply through the Federal Reserve System and are relying instead on the U.S. Treasury, which is limited to $100 million. So they're saying we're opting out of the inflationary money supply back for the limited money supply. Um, so endorsed by members bank by member banks or also a banker's acceptance or special drawing rights certificates. So this this right here opens the door for Bretton Woods agreement and also for a I, I don't know if I put it in this uh, in the slideshow, but also in uh, 2020 um, with one of the acts that was passed for Corona, they also slipped in um, a, another way for inflating the, the monetary supply. There's this special drawing rights fund, and basically they just at, at, tacked on a couple more zeros for the fund. That way they can continue pretend land. We're, we're in imagination land. Collateral for security shall be notes, drafts, bills of exchange. Let's go on to define what notes, drafts, and bills of exchange are. <clears throat> okay, so this is the connection with the UCC. The UCC is the Uniform Commercial Code. Equity was blended with law so that commerce could be could could function more fluidly <clears throat> between participating parties. America is a bankrupt nation and is owned completely by its creditors, which are private banking interests. Most courts are operating in an admiralty maritime jurisdiction uh, capacity essentially as debt collectors for the private banks. Where are the banks truly? They're the courts. Uh, any case that you would have in a court is bonded, it, usually in the tens of thousands to, <clears throat> excuse me, depending on what's being discussed in court, hundreds of thousands. And, um, and that's a whole rabbit hole in itself, bonds, uh, court bonds. But you can go ahead and go on to the next one. Yeah, and that, well... U UCC is such an important idea as well, but we don't have to maybe get in the weeds on UCC other than this uniform code. We will is, a little bit. It, it's, you know, that's a U.S. thing, UCC, but it's becoming more and more standardized worldwide through Unidroit is what you want to look up on that. Unidroit. Yeah, I want to I want to just throw a whole bunch of synchronicity in while we're hot on the topic. Barcelona. Barcelona is the birthplace of the original UCC in its in its oldest incarnation. And that is uh the this is it's a very uh esoteric name for a location. Uh it is actually the crab Bart, Bars in reverse is crab, and Leona is the lion. And uh, it just, it never ceases to amaze me how zodiacal our language is, especially the more important the subject matter. Uh, but also Barth is a, it's a bris, which is a covenant. It's an agreement. And here again, also, you'll hear the echo in the Britain woods. You got the Brith again. All of these things have to do with a eunuch, uniform 
the uniform. This is all about uh, consistent cultural conquest, going back to Cortez, going back to Queen, uh, Queen Isabel, that's uh, Sibyl, you know, Roman Sibyl law, all of this stuff. I know it sounds weird, but the world really does rotate around the phallus in the in the craziest way and it's all psychologically built in and ingrained into these terms and so i just wanted to throw this all out there that well what what's the latin word for language lingua lingua lingua, lingua. lingua is a phallus yes yeah. and this is so weird and i just want to put this out there that it almost I'm starting to believe that the more it makes you want to recoil or look away, the more profane it appears, the more important it is that you stay the course. And then I want to also put this on the table just real quick on on our way through that in the times that the witch hunt fires up, uh, when it fired up in Germany, when it fired up in in the UK and when it fired up over in Salem, the. Uh, the media of the day would start to trigger the echoes of Cybele and the Sibylline oracles would start to show their face. And all of this goes back to uh, the uniform uh, aspect of circumcision. And it is really profound what, uh, what a psychological trigger it has been throughout history and how we find ourselves tracking this consistency through time in realizing, huh, we are all eunuch formed in a very special way. So I just wanted, and I just wanted to say it's also a hazard uh, that as people start to realize, wait a second, why is our language insinuating so much around our phallus? And there's a very good reason for that. And it's very important. You might have to stare into the abyss a little longer to find the truth behind that. Rant over circumcise circumscribe we know what circumcise is but to circumscribe is to enclose within a limit to confine to bound to write around <laughs> and they're writing in circles around the public you know <laughs> that's true uh most people are definitely not getting the right 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 there are many different versions of that word but uh tover you have anything to weigh in on we've been going a while with that. I know we're getting close to your bedtime. No, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I like to have definitions. I like to have grammar, you know, the, the whole thing with this, the grammar of it is important. So I don't want to speak unless my grammar is correct. So that's why I like, you know, listening to these definitions and reading them. Yeah. Which is why I always constantly harp on the 1828 dictionary, which is, where you're going to find a more likely to find anyway, a uh, honest definition of a word that is not quite so divorced from it is it's legalistic meaning in the modern parlance. A lot of English words have become inverted from their original uh, etymological meaning, which is also the similarity between the original and etymological meaning will show up in the, Black's law or the legalese version, but in modern words, parlay it says definitely taken a, a 180 in many ways, in many ways, which is part of the, the circumscribing around us and limiting us. What's the what's the etymological root of collateral? Collateral. I'll think on that. We'll let James continue. I have no idea, so I'm interested as well. Um, so this is taken from mo most of the definitions that I use this evening is from uh, Cornell University. And so you can, they have searchable documents for the UCC and for uh, United States Code annotated and a lot of other things if you, if you care to jump in that deep. Uh, UCC section 3-104 negotiable instruments. So this is, this is where the uh, the birth certificate being a warehouse receipt, if people are familiar with that claim. This is where that comes in and where it can be collateralized and monetized. And 
it, it can be made into a security which can be traded and this is how uh, money is is truly created is through negotiable instruments promises to pay negotiable instrument means an unconditional promise or order to pay a fixed amount of money with or without interest or other charges prescribed in the promise or order it has to be payable to the bearer or to or or to order at the time it is issued or first comes into possession of holder and is payable on demand or at a definite time and then there's a, a third tense for this that or a third uh condition that has to be present as well it's on the next slide does not state that some that anyone has to undertake something else in order to receive the payment so if it so let me back up does not state any other undertaking or instruction by the person promising or ordering payment to do any act in addition to the payment of money. But the promise or order may contain an undertaking or power to give, maintain, or protect collateral to secure payment, an authorization or power to the holder to confess judgment or realize on or dispose of collateral, or a waiver of the benefit of any law intended for the advantage or protection of an obligor. So, a negotiable instrument is a promise to pay a certain sum. Can, can you go back? Oh, I don't have it pulled up here. But right now, we don't have any money. The way that our public system is working is solely on special drawing rights or promises to pay. These things are being like an unfunded liability, not like it could be funded by anything. There is no substance. We have gone from substance to form. So now there is no, uh, there is no gold backing it. There, there's hardly, sounds kind of mutable, doesn't it? It sounds very mercurial. Mutable. Mutable. Yeah. It sounds like, go, go ahead, Gabriel. No, I hear what you're saying there, buddy. Yeah, man. Yeah, that's a big that's a big weave. That's something that Topher and I talked about over on his uh, his channel. Uh, put a pin on that, and if you haven't seen our show, uh, go go give it a good listen because uh, uh, we're in a newly mutable age as of 2012. Smith Munt Remodernization Act. Huge weave there. Huge huge weave. Does that mean whenever we enter a new age, that Part of what allows for the mutability is censorship. <laughs> Could be, yeah. You have to censor the old way and the yeah. old, the old can, word. I mean, yeah. it's so it's so all prevailing. It goes all the way down to your autocorrect on your phone. Mm -hmm. It's 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 in more places than you can imagine. It's taken me months to even compile the list. It's so profound. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to. Uh, correspond that with what Topher's saying. You can go ahead and, and move ahead because I'm trying to stitch something together with these. Good. So, it, and it continues on in, in the definition of, uh, of negotiable instruments that an order meets an order meets all of the requirements of subsection a except paragraph one that it be payable on demand right then and there so they're like okay if you're going to tell me that you're going to promise me this then it has to be like here right now except when and other except paragraph one and otherwise it falls within the definition of a check and is a, in subsection f which they define check in subsection f and it becomes a negotiable instrument and a check an instrument is a note like a Federal Reserve note. That's why I put the uh, special emphasis is that these notes are negotiable instruments that we're trading about, like Chance, you, you referenced. They're debt notes. They're notes just to go, I'm just pass I'm passing the buck. There's a series called Passing the Buck, and it's all about discharging debt because you can't pay it. There's no, <laughs> there's no substance. There, I, it's it's that simple, but it's that complex. There is nothing to pay debt. People are giving people like, giving one another pieces of paper and saying, "Oh yeah, I'll pay you." Okay, now give that to someone else, and they can use that to say, "I'll pay you." 
it really is that friggin' autistically convoluted. Um, an instrument is a note. If it is a promise, and it is a draft, if it is an order. If and so, we just read what an order is. If an instrument falls within the definition of both note and draft, a person entitled to enforce the instrument may treat it as either. Basically, the person entitled to enforce is defined as someone with a superior claim. First in line is first in time. This goes back to the, this maxim of equity. You, you, as the superior claimant, can claim to be the creator of your documents. You can monetize them through the venue of the uni Uniform Commercial Code. You have the capacity to be a private banker as well. This is what a lot of gurus in, in the law movement are, are attempting to teach people that is actually getting people in a lot of trouble because they're using like uh, already signified routing numbers, things that already exist. It's not their own creation. They're not creating these things and they're trying to, they're trying to fall back on the system to create through the system instead of creating through themselves. If you have seven silver pieces, you can say that my my instrument is backed by the security of my seven silver pieces. Um, and so with this shuffling around of debt notes, passing the buck as it were, it is, in my opinion, symptomatic of such a system that you would see a inevitable not only transfer of real estate and real property to those that actually hold real wealth that are not passing around debt notes but also life force energy diminishes in the you know the the vessels that are deficient of credit <laughs> that we see uh, a simpler way of putting that would just be that we see public health, which is a talismanic word and phrase in and of itself uh, for, you know, many spells cast in the name of public health, but that public health in the, the reality of what the health of people in the public, not the legal sense of public, but the general health of people in the community, in the civilization is sliding further and further into debt in in itself in a debt of or deficiency of life force energy or ability to hold life force energy which is a tension as well which makes us a slippery slope you know the the less atten the less life force you have the less attention you have to notice that you're losing life force and you know it becomes an actual zombie apocalypse type thing so this brings me back to collateral so Technically, we're the collateral on all this debt, right? So the there's a relationship between the value that we can present over a lifetime and how that's securitized into debt instruments, right? So that would... Uh, you know what the other meaning of collateral is, Topher? No. It is, uh, it's a genealogical term as well, referring to descendants that proceed from one another not in a direct line, but co-laterally. As in, ah. if I have my, my sister has children, and if I have children, the children of our children are collateral relations. So all of this collateralization of the in the system is like you're selling out your brother's children, you know? Right. And these and we're collateralized in in not really a, a legal contract because we we're not really we don't really know what we're doing our parents really didn't know what what they were signing up for per se but before getting to all the the specifics of that there has to be a an energetic because you brought up public health there has to be a diminishment of of those that don't aren't in good standing, like their feet aren't on land. They don't have necessarily property. They're, they're not actually, their, their feet aren't, you know, cause human rights start with property rights, right? So like, if you don't have your property and your feet aren't on, on land, that's debt free, you know, there's all these like steps that diminish there. There's like a diminishment with that. I could see that on a spiritual level.
What is a bill of exchange? A bill of exchange is an instrument, negotiable in form, by which one who is called the drawer or the creator requests another called the drawee to pay a specified sum of money. These were intended to be good faith. And like you're, like you're saying, Topher, the, the contracts that we're party to at this point weren't made consciously and entered into um, through our will. We, we didn't know, but it's our performance in the terms of the contract that now has created the joinder. And so there are certain folks that will argue that the compelled benefit of, uh, of money is, un is unconscionable and therefore that is the route for which you get to discharge debt. And I, I don't understand another way that it could be. Like, because how, how are you ever going to do, like you said, if someone has only been born in it, they're, they're living in an inner city and so they just come, they just come out uh, and they're waking up and they're like, I don't even have any property. I don't have anything to collateralize to make money. How, how would I trade my word for value to someone? And, and the, the only way that, that that has been done is through signing up for uh, s signing up to be an administrative vessel, to signing up to, to make this special election to be a federal citizen because the knowledge has not been given to us. And thus we have to go search for it. Like I don't, I don't have the answers. I'm not a law expert. This is just stuff that I'm reading that anyone can go and read and set their mind towards. And it's, it is a big rabbit hole, but whenever you start to connect the dots, especially linguistically, you start to see the ways in which our minds are being limited by government. Um, so universal uh, international bills of exchange, we can, we can go on to the next, uh, to the next slide. International bills of exchange. This is from the UN Convention on International Bills of Exchange. And these are the requirements that, that need to be on a piece of paper to draw up a bill of exchange. So the, the bill of exchange it can have money that's represented through anything that money is represented through. So you can have silver, you can, you can have something of tangible value. You can have federal reserve notes. You can have silver certificates. You can have gold. And then there are also promissory notes. So let, let's read the definition here. An international bill of exchange is a bill of exchange, which specifies at least two of the following places and indicates that any two so specified are situated in different states. That capital S is a very important thing because it can be states being countries. It can be states being uh, Missouri and Louisiana. Um, it, it, I, I take it a, a step further that it can be states as in mental states. Like where are you at on, on your plane as well? The place where the bill is drawn, because if your bill stays drawn in your mind and you're like, I'm going to make this exchange with someone, it's not constituted. It, it has no constitution. It, it isn't made known uh, it, it isn't made plain in black and white the place indicated next to the signature of the drawer uh the place indicated next to the name of the drawer. so these are just these are places where you have to sign you have to give your uh get give your um your autograph your your signature to give it to to enliven the document the the place indicated next to the name of the payee and the place of payment so it only has to have two of these things and the cur currently we're talking, we went from a very small microcosm. Now we're talking about how nations are exchanging currency and making stuff up. Because this is where, the, I, like I was trying to weave with the Matt Presti, with, with, with talking about Matt Presti's documentary, is that we are captivated by the imagination of magicians right now. And we are forgetting where value is coming from and how money is being made. Money is being made on the promise of our labor and of the labor of our progeny. Our issues, what we issue, are our children. And, and that, that's a, a legal definition is that your issues are your progeny or are your posterity. 
Um, yeah, what you just said is super crucial because uh, in the ancient system, the astronomer priests would be called magi. That's what magi means. It is not talking about shooting lightning at your fingertips or talking about pulling rabbits out of hats other than the fact that, you know, that would, those things would be based on illusion and trickery. <laughs> the magi is the judge. That's the magistrate, the lowercase g God. All of those words are synonyms in the legal language. So we are talking about a, you know, ecclesiastical system here that the judge is the astronomer priest, even if they do not practice astronomy anymore or practice priestcraft in what we would call it today as we see it in churches, which are not even, you know, churches are not even actually the priestcraft anymore. They're more like kind of uh, rhetoric of the dogma of the worldview that is, you know, the common accepted mythology. They're sort of basically just mouthpiece for mythology and uh, f fable explainers <laughs> rather than having anything to do with what priesthood was originally in uh, prior times, which had everything to do with judicial astrology, it's called, which is the projecting forward of events to come through the knowledge of the sky clock and the writing of history through scribing what they see in the sky and rewinding the clock, so to speak, to decide what must have happened in the past. This, you know, use of astrology to predict, prophesize, and uh, reach back into the eons of the past and decide what they contained and mythologize those with allegory and story. That is the definition of judicial astrology. So these magi are the judges. It's just that the system has evolved and compartmentalized its different parts so that, you know, the ones wearing the black robe banging the gavel aren't exactly the same as the ones that are <laughs> in the in the banks doing the gravel or in the temple burning the offering or what have you. It's compartmentalized itself further as it's fractured uh, by necessity of growth and globalism but we're talking about the same thing this is an ecclesiastical system the ju the uh the justice system it's all one thing in terms of its radical roots yeah man yeah and, and so when was the papal bull issued that the the pope claimed basically all all living beings unum sanctum the u.s but, so at at that juncture is basically where we have we as individuals have to make a superior claim why because that is where the, the the starting point for collateralizing human energy starts is that no one is going inside of themselves to one up the the guy that's already first in line no one has a superior claim on you except for god that dude's gonna <laughs> that dude God's going to take you out of this place as much as he puts you in this place. That, that There is only one above us all. And it ain't the Pope. And so, but as long as these claims stand unrebutted, it is a commercial maxim. An unrebutted claim stands as truth. And so we have to start reclaiming these things. I know that all of this crap that I'm presenting is so convoluted and dense. I Honestly, it's, it's distasteful because it isn't honest. The honest truth is that it is based on your behavior and it is a property rights issue. As long as we are using their script and their property and we're not forming a new trust or even looking at the old trust, the constitution, that's, that's the most recent trust. There's a lot of stuff that's really good about it. There's a lot of stuff that is being, that is very coercive in the administrative portion of it. It's very important for us to make those claims in our lives. Claim your family. Don't just try to give your family away to the state. Start to claim more responsibility. Why? Because God's going to fill you up with the capacity to fulfill it. Because you're making the claim. You're, you are doing God. That is so give, important give what you just said. The, the level of responsibility that you are willing to claim 
unto yourself is equivalent to the capacity and energy and life force and consciousness that you will be endowed with by your creator to accomplish or achieve the overcoming of said obstacles that you are now responsible for. That is the depth. What you just described is exactly the mentality required to exit victim consciousness forever. That the amount of responsibility I'm willing to claim is the amount of energy based on the decision of the making of the decision that I will be endowed with along the road to achieve those things. If they are in alignment with good truth and beautiful and you talking about how convoluted all this is it is because i i actually do subscribe to the platonic idea if i'm pretty sure it's plato that or so socrates that all learning is remembering and so whenever we're going through the process of memorization of things that are not innate to nature it is arduous it is laborious you know, it's not as fun and as much zing and enlivening as it is to remember aspects about nature or about ourselves that are true and, uh, you know, th that have that spiritual uplift to them. But that's part of what makes this the uh, the spiritual thing that it is to study the legal system, because it's about that circumscribing thing that the truth is a great big circle of the all that ever was in capital R reality. And because we're talking about an infinite reality, infinite energy, infinite life force, boundless, limitless, the only way we can really come to understand it is by describing what it isn't. And so learning this legalese is a perfect way of learning what isn't reality, man's law. What isn't natural law? Man's law. And it uh, it is helpful in that capacity. It is. It's such a huge a huge chunk of the realm we're in uh in you know one thing i think about often is uh concentric circles as a jurisdiction and natural law is the there is no circle it, it's it is it is the all there's no circle in what is the the maximum amount of responsibility you can possibly perceive and then what i've recently learned of uh you know, in like psychology and philosophy, they say that whatever your understanding or grasp on or capacity to to grok the this topic, all of that needs to be aligned with one other person who's right next to you right now, James. You found somebody else who agrees on the magnitude of the weight of this topic that we're talking about. And it is truly a fascinating miracle that you can find another person who agrees uh, with the weight of it all. And that is uh, and that's that's a true blessing to find somebody else who sees it eye to eye with you. It really is. And to take that to another level of what the weave is that I'm I'm like Sag, like my son is like Sag all the way. <laughs> uh, we, we did that a couple of years ago to just kind of see what my son and um, all, all the jazz I'm still very new to astrology. I think it's fascinating because I love patterns. And Elise is a Gemini, so she's like my polar. And it's just, it, it works. It works. We rub each other in all the, in the right ways to get our edges uh, meshing. It's, it's great to have a Gemini gal, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, they'll, but, give you but, they'll give you the truth. It's very helpful. Um, and so... I, I want I want to leave folks with the importance that it it's more important about your behavior. It's more important with how much responsibility you're willing to take on in your life because it's a very it's a very long road to wake up to all of all of that stuff. You don't really have to concern yourself with it as much as you might think. Whether you have a birth certificate or a uh, social security card or anything, if you have those things, the thing that I would encourage you to do is if you're going to do business. Own a business, own a business, and have your business be the financial pass through, and be a, be an upstanding person. Do do what you can to have the morality that people in your community want to genuinely want to see. And whenever people see it, they resonate with it. So you have more of that increased morality, and that's what's able to build trust. And you're able to look at people whenever uh, it's S H T A F, 
and you're able to look at people and go, oh, we're not freaking out. Yeah, like even though there's fear on the television, we can just look at each other and see reality. We can see real people. Like you can see a smiling face instead of like, oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, but we have to nip that in the butt. Take deeper breaths. Take bit. Take bigger leaps in responsibility and increase our capacity to do well for ourselves and for the world. It, it, it is reciprocity. It's like you're sawing the eternal law. But you're not gonna get. You're not gonna get through it alive, but you'll get through it. Beautiful guys. Uh, do you want to cover off your last couple slides here? There's two more. Yeah, yeah, we can pop them off. Thanks for the powerhouse presentation here, James. Loving it. I, I was trying to find a way to weave all this stuff because it's it's way too big of a topic. It it really takes hours and hours to like describe all of this stuff. And so it's exactly um, the same as studying the universal language and the mythology. It is a million points of detail that create a constellation and an image in your mind when you have all of them in view, you know, in your arms around it. But you do that's why I listen to y'all. That's why I listen to you guys. That way, uh, you know, you can condense points into bite-sized chunks where I can go, ooh, that was a tasty morsel. I'm going down that rabbit hole for a while. Um, so let's see. So this convention does not deal with, uh, with the question of sanctions that may be imposed under national law in cases where incorrect or false statement has been made on an instrument in respect of a place refer to in a paragraph one or two of this article however any such sanctions shall not affect the validity of the instrument or the application of this convention and so like this is a this is a a, a un convention and this is being recognized as the way of doing business it is through bills of exchange and promissory notes this is how poor nations are pledging labor or resources to be able to get more money um money doesn't represent anything intrinsically. And I think we're all getting that. I don't have to keep beating that horse. But <clears throat> Article 3 says that a bill of exchange is, writ is a written instrument. And so we're back at instruments, negotiable instruments. This whole thing is about negotiable instruments. And so there are two parties coming together to really parse out the details of what's going on. And so this is consent driven. This is behaviorally driven. And this is why I just keep harping on it um, and, and how important it is for us to be uh, to be creators in our own capacity. Because with a blank slate, with a piece of paper, we can construct how we want to see a community interact and, and how we want to see it govern. These are these are governing documents. It doesn't have to be a government that is uh, oppressive, but there is going to be government. This is the thing is that. There, there is no absolutism with, um, with, with anarchy. It cannot happen. The guy with the biggest stick cannot be the dude. All it, it has, it has happened, and it seems to be that that's the thing that makes it spin another revolution. But that's not, that's not the long term plan. That's not God's plan. I. That's what I truly think, believe, feel, whatever the heck you want to say. Otherwise, why does it keep breaking? Because it's man's creation and we're still stepping outside of what, what I think and believe is a, a better way. And it's that we have to construct it ourselves every time. I think that it just is going to break. Uh, and I think that it's built into it. It's built into that whatever we build up our castles are made of sand and they're going to be washed away by the tide god is the tide god is the sand it's just all going back in the sword yeah man perfect timing and, for your little internet cut out too <laughs> i'm gonna let your internet uh, come back here right. and i'll read your yeah. final slide here as a bankrupt nation, we are functioning on promises that have ultimately become backed by us, the people. Many folks get this notion, but the logical conclusion is serfdom or a type of slavery if you are operating within this system. It's not even the logical conclusion. It is the, it's the 
it's the journey, <laughs> you know, the whole journey is serfdom. Uh, we may begin, it just gets to a conclusion of more apparent and obvious slavery as it goes, uh, as the, the revolution turns. We may begin to redefine our relationship with the system starting when we wake up. Uh, and that's... And I mean that like each day. Each day that you wake up is where you start to redefine your relationship. And I think it is a, it is a relationship with our creator. And you have to ask for the capacity to make the change that you want to see in the world. Um, and, and the thing is, it's black and, it's black and white. They're, both options are there. Free, it's a free will realm. If it wasn't a free will realm, you couldn't have one guy run off in the darkness and try to be the baddest bad guy, or some guy try to go sit on top of a mountain and be the goodest good guy. Like the, it, it's, it's hard to sit in that place where both forces are colliding. It is a rock and a hard place. And it's it's a narrow path, it's a narrow gate. And each day we start there. And then it's it, it's like it's like the movement of the serpent, man. You you end up getting drawn into the light and you go back into the dark where, where your thoughts are, where the imagination is, then you come back out into the light. Private, public, private, public. <clears throat> That's a so, solid uh, weave right there. Solid weave. I just dropped a link into the chat. I'm going to drop it again so you can be very sure what I'm talking about. But this is a God's Acre for Winds of the Soul, the fourth book of the Spirit World series by Dylan Sicosio, who's in the chat here. Uh, he has really done a good job exposing the ecclesiastical nature of the system. Uh, in previous books in the series, there is more foundational knowledge, in particular, book two, Blackest of All Magic, which we covered on a vibrant not long ago. But God's Acre for Winds of the Soul is, a like all the Spirit World books, is a good standalone book that you could start with and get, go around to the other ones in the order that you prefer. You'll probably want to revisit them all multiple times. Even if you've read it, it's a great way to refresh your knowledge. So uh, I narrated and produced the audiobook for this one. <laughs> it's finally up. If you want to check it out, uh, you can get a free audiobook through the audible link i sh showed here if you have never created an audible account so that's a good deal for you and right it, my sultry sexy audiobook voice which is deeper and uh you know more more <laughs> slow and enunciating <laughs> check it out and you will find in that book all kinds of evidence from the church itself, the early church fathers of the fraud and forgery rife within the system, the ecclesiastical system and the ecclesiastical history that is the, you know, the foundation of the claim upon humanity that the p Pope is the vicar or replacement of Christ, who is a, uh, at least in their system, a fictional character, <laughs> you know, so it's important that it's important to get this information in one way or the other so that you know what you're looking at when you encounter it. And it's a really good, really good book. So hope people will check that out and support me, support Dylan, and most importantly, support your own knowledge. So here's uh, the link again, God's Acre for Winds of the Soul, book four of the Spirit World series, if you like it. I also narrated book three, July's End with Black Swans, and book five is on the way, The Holy Sailors. I personally have a physical copy an electronic copy and an audiobook copy of all of the books in the series that they're really valuable resources and will turn you on to more resources if you really want to get scholarly and study the uh you know the originators of all of these ideas good stuff awesome yeah and great stuff everybody in this conversation thanks for all being here and James, he really brought it. I'm sure that, you know, wrapping this up in a logical conclusion is kind of impossible. In fact, I feel like this is more of a part one of this crowd to take this forward and talk more about uh, interacting with the system or not interacting with the system in terms of how our issue, <laughs> our children are involved. I mean, that was kind of promised on the table uh, in terms of the topic, but it's a vibrant. So, you know, you get what you get. <laughs> we'll, I think that we'll talk about this another time. I would love to include Topher and, and James in another uh, 
team up like this. You guys are crushing. Excellent. And closing thoughts, Tover? No, thank you for having us. I appreciate it. Closing thoughts, uh, Gabriel? This was freaking awesome. I love these power weaves. This is a real crucial knowledge drop right here. I was snapping little screenshots, but I'm going to go back and get more. This was really great. Thank you so much for consolidating all this, man. You do a great job, James. Presentation is sharp, brother. Like a I razor. Put the, uh, I'm going to go ahead and drop the link to these slides in the, or a, you know, a download for these slides in the Interverse Telegram channel and the Vibrant Telegram channel. So, you know, if you're not in there, what are you doing? That's where we all hang out all day. Come on. <laughs> Links in the show notes for that. It's yeah, good to see one. you, Family Fungi. Yeah, good, good to see you, Elise. Thanks for being there. <laughs> yeah, I just being on the same page with your with your man there. <laughs> you guys are amazing. It's so it's important. Yeah, it's crazy stuff. It's so important. But whenever he first brought it up, all of this, all of this, it was so much. I I seriously couldn't even look at it at one point. I was like. I don't know what to do with all it because you have to question everything and that can be very hard. Yeah. But whenever it came to our children, I just remember being scared about it because I didn't want to get in trouble. Like mm. I didn't want someone to come take my kids or like, I didn't want us to be kicked out in the street. I don't know, like killed. I don't know. Like, all of these fear things came to mind, but whenever you realize that you're, you're not doing anything wrong, you're just choosing not to use their system. Like it's really okay. No one's gonna come kick down your door. No one's gonna come kick down your door. Yeah, seriously, it be be a lawful person. That's that's really that's really it. Like person in the sense of that that we understand colloquially. <laughs> And like, just be just, a good person. Like we know all of our neighbors; they're really nice. Like mm -hmm. uh, we go to farmers market. It, we yeah. have a strong community, like the community we've met online. And so yeah, and like we don't go around going, you know, do you know about this? Do you like? Uh, do you know about social securities, or social security numbers, and birth certificates? He tried that. And it didn't uh, yeah, I did work try out. That. I did try that. <laughs> like, I got, I got bit. We lost. We all, we all do it at one, one point, you know. Yeah. yeah. I made that mistake. Stuff, so. Mom, we didn't go to the moon. <laughs> yeah, I. <laughs> uh, so I hope I didn't muddy the waters. That wasn't my intention, but I did want to lay these piece, these documents bare so that people see them in the light. So this is how the government is acting about it, and they expect us to perform and act about it. Now, again, the most important thing is. For you to be in some way, be a producer. Whether you're a creative through art, tap into the that, that it literally spirit. is the same thing as being a creditor rather than a debtor, uh, mm -hmm. a, a creator rather than a consumer, mm -hmm. or at least balance the two things. You know, balance your books. And that's the thing is learning how to operate on the waters of commerce. That's why I recommend people get a business and stop doing business in your personal name. And aside from that, learn trust law. It's a great way to uh, extend your property to your children, to their children, to their children. And but you have to write it like a governing document. That, spe that there are specific terms that have to be in line with their behavior. Are you know? Do they have to maintain a piece of property, cut the grass twice a week, and everything, and the hedges be cut, and uh, all the blueberries fertilized? It could get as ridiculous as you want, but it could be simply that this is a vehicle to hold property in, in uh, for your posterity. And you name beneficiaries, and then you name a trustee to execute the trust. And then from there, that that trustee, which typically could be would be you, if you're the if you're the papa, you, you need to take on that responsibility of being the primary trustee, the first trustee, to see that it's executed properly. And then train the next trustee because it's not about us. It's about our kids. And then once they're old enough to realize that it's not about them, it's about their kids and, and so on and so forth. And you would like to leave that legacy 
that they have a foundation to stand on, that they have the property that's been kept from not from being pilfered by the pirates in the courts. That's what's going on. You you die and your estate goes into probate, dude. It, you're bummed. You're either getting taxed to to high heaven, <laughs> or you are getting your property uh, seized. Basically, that, that's uh, those are pretty much the options with probate. Um, and so the the way to avoid probate is to have a non commercial trust. You can also have a commercial trust. There are some interesting things that people might want to investigate, like a Massachusetts business trust or an unincorporated business trust. These are some terms that you can use as a jumping off point to go educate yourself about how the wealthy or the elite, whatever they want to call themselves, how they use these pass through entities, these financial vehicles so that they are still able to own nothing and control everything. The trust owns it, but they get to control it through either being a beneficiary or being the trustee. And there, there's a whole mm -hmm. rabbit hole to go down to study that stuff. And uh, just to put a little esoteric spin on that, like you mentioned vehicle quite a few times right there, and I'm thinking I'm seeing chariot card, chariot card, chariot card the whole time. The judge is the uh, the recumbent. He's the enthroned one. You got to dethrone that motherfucker, and make your own vehicle, and you know, take control, take the wheel. And just to slide back to what Elise was saying about having that that uh, that fear paradigm of some authority figure, some some papa in heaven to come down and smite thee for uh, not not doing not doing commerce stuff the right way. <laughs> like I mean, that happens when you're lying or you're actually causing harm to people. It doesn't happen whenever you're like, I'm just not, I'm, I'm opting out of this. I'm opting out of this to form something better. What is it gonna be? I'm gonna lay the foundation because it's private. I don't go around speaking to everyone about my private affairs. This is a very important thing is that we, the, in the age of social media, people wanna share everything far and wide. That's not privacy. Privacy is family, is boundaries. You have to have healthy boundaries. If you don't have a healthy boundary, then what's private? And that's where the, the communistic ideas pierce the veil into people's imagination is that it feels, it, oh, it feels, it's all love. It's just share. Come on, everybody share. Dude, whatever, the, the tragedy of the commons is that people, that some, <laughs> some Indian poops too close to the teepee or poops in the river. <laughs> that's the tragedy of the commons. And that's, you have to have your boundaries. This is why you do it with foundational documents like trusts for your family or a business. Like a business has to have some sort of foundation where you're listing out the property. But what, what does the business have? What gives it a structure? And to do that, you have to be a very well-organized individual inside of yourself successfully to do that. <clears throat> well said, sir. Gentle folks, I'm out. I'll see you soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Topher. <laughs> hey, thanks for hanging out so late. Um, and yeah, we're wrapping up this whole thing anyway. It's been awesome. See you guys on Sunday for whatever Sunday. Surprise, surprise. We'll see what that is. Maybe. I don't even know. <laughs> uh, and James, Elise, beautiful to see you. Gabriel, I love you, buddy. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, we'll, we'll do it all again soon. See Catch you guys. you guys later. Thanks, everyone in the audience. And uh, please Peace. do check out that audiobook. Very worth your time. Very worth your time. Good night. Much love, y'all.